controlled by API calls. So every web service provides access to it through Amazon Web Services API calls. And there are many ways to interact with these APIs. One is the one that you just saw in the uh, short video before, using the web management console that we control. We provide encrypted access to this management console. And we also allow you to enable multi-factor authentication using a device like this to increase security. And then it's the management console that talks directly to the APIs. A second method to access the API is by using software libraries and software development kits, or SDKs. Uh, all the most common languages are available, Java, PHP, Ruby, Python, .NET, as well as development for mobile environments, such as Android or iOS on iPhones. And we also have a toolkit for Eclipse, which is a very popular development uh, uh, console that developers use a lot. A third way to access the API is the old style command line interface, typing directly API calls using, of course, uh, um, an, an, a package that you can download from our website. And the fourth way to access the APIs is by using resource management tools provided usually by third parties, such as Puppet, Chef, PyChef for Python and many others, as well as many other commercial ones. And these are kind of uh, the equivalent of a director being able to manage an orchestra uh, from distance. And of course, you can use all of them. You can use the one that you want based on your specific needs, on your specific skills. However, on this presentation today, I will focus mostly on the management console for the reason that it's simpler to show things on, the, on a visual uh, console and it will be clear for everybody, even for non-technical people. Cost, as I mentioned before, is affected by the way you architect. For example, you saw before that EC2 instances can be of different types, and every type of instance have specific features. Some of them are optimized for memory, some of them are optimized for high CPU usage. You can compress data when you move it uh, outside AWS. Now, traffic to AWS is free, but when you uh, send things out of AWS, maybe to the internet, to your users, you still pay for data transfer. You can compress data if you want, and if you want to uh, uh, lower your costs. And your backup strategy, uh, which was briefly mentioned by Werner before, can affect, uh, of course, your costs. For example, Amazon S3 offers two types of durability options. The default one is high durability, and then there is also the reduced durability. And to give you a comparison, they have different durability uh, percentages, but also different costs. So if you don't need a high durability, you can just opt for the reduced durability and save on costs. And as a cloud architect, you have to consider these things because they can significantly impact your cost savings. Let me give you a short example of how two different types of EC2 instances can, can affect your price or your performance. Uh, we use a measure for the CPU power of every EC2 machine. We call it elastic compute unit. And one ECU roughly equates to a 1.2 gigahertz Xeon processor. If you launch a small instance, you will get one elastic compute unit, 1.7 gigabytes of RAM, some storage, and of course, cost uh, depending on, also on the region you launch it. If you launch a medium one, you will get about twice as much the cost to run that machine, twice as much the storage, but very importantly, five times the CPU power. So if you want to run some uh, highly CPU intensive tasks, you can save a lot of money by using medium instances, or maybe just use, uh, let's say, get the same amount of um, uh, cost, but being able to run much more CPU tasks on the same, uh, with the same cost. This is, again, our management console. We are on Amazon EC2. When you launch a new instance, you can select from the Amazon Linux AMIs, the disk images, or Red Hat, SUSE Linux, Windows. And once you select the one you want, here you can decide which type of instance fits your specific needs. And, of course, influence costs as well. So these are the four things that you should consider when you start architecting for the cloud. The difference between physical and cloud, scalability, much easier to do in the cloud now, how to interface the cloud services as well as costs, 
And um, before I forget, uh, when you use AWS, you can do something like launch EC2 with EBS behind ELB with your domain on RAT53 and your videos on CloudFront, backup to S3 and your DB on RDS with multi -SZ. So this is just to say that we use a lot of acronyms and of course some of you are not familiar with these acronyms. But the point is that I will try to make things simple enough to be understandable even if you're not familiar with acronyms. But as a cloud architect you will eventually need to learn some of it uh, along the way. So let me start with these seven principles. And the first one is very interesting, is design for failure and nothing will fail. So when um, car companies design cars, of course, they design for failure. They ask themselves, what happens when, not if, but when a car crashes? And then they do a lot of things to make sure that the passengers are possibly not affected by the accident. So they design for failure, and as a result, cars are much safer than they were, for example, even a few years ago. The same concept should apply to your design, your architecture for the cloud. There are, of course, many things that can be said, but for example, your backup and restore strategy is the first step that you should take in designing properly for failure. Uh, you can become impervious to reboots or relaunches. If your machine has any uh, type of hardware issue, it might happen that the machine itself needs to be rebooted. When the machine reboots, uh, she, that machine needs to know what she should do. Uh, it should, uh, I don't know, run a web server or should just uh, sit waiting for someone else to tell to that machine what she has to do, etc. And you can do so by, for example, moving in-memory sessions to data store. So the in-memory sessions that were there just before the reboot are not lost. A few other things are using availability zones and possibly distribute EC2 across different uh, isolated locations. You can use the Elastic Load Balancer, which is a service that we provide to you that allows to uh, load balance across multiple machines in parallel. You can also use the RDS, the Relational Database Service, in combination with Multi-AZ to make it uh, impervious to failure. And use also the Elastic IP, which is an IP that you can map to a specific EC2 instance. And we're going to see a little bit more about this later. Let me tell you how the AWS global infrastructure works. So this is, of course, the globe. And we have uh, currently five regions, two in the US, one in Europe, and two in the Asia Pacific. And every region is a set of multiple data centers. We divide them logically into availability zones. And every availability zone is a distinct location insulated from failures from the other availability zones. And they also enjoy low latency connectivity between them in the same region. So in addition to this, to these five regions here, I just reduced their sides to make it clearer for you. We also have the uh, edge locations for CloudFront, which is a CDN service, a content delivery service that allows you to copy your content closer to the end user and then distribute it in a much more efficient way. And Route 53, which is a DNS service. Let's take as an example one of this region, for example, Singapore, and let's take a closer look at it. So as I told you before, we have two availability zones in Singapore in this case, AP Southeast 1A and B. And these are two physically isolated locations. They enjoy very good connectivity between them. So if you want to take advantage of multi z deployments, you can just, for example, run some EC2 instances in one uh, availability zone and some others in the other availability zone and then synchronize them together. If you do this, it means that even if there is a problem affecting one entire availability zone, your um, applications are still up and running because you can serve your customers from the other availability zone. The same thing can apply to the relational database service, which is, for the one that don't know, is an automated database in the cloud. You can run either MySQL or Oracle databases. We manage them for you. You just use them. But as Werner mentioned before, when you run a database, a single machine, that machine, of course, can fail. And if it fails, it's usually lots of issues. So when you run uh, RDS, you can launch a master database and with one click, enable a standby replica. 
and they synchronize